The last part of this course is a short three section unit on conic sections. And I realize you might be watching this video not actually as part of my course, but it's okay. Welcome you as well. But just if you're sort of following along, there's three sections here on conic sections. So we're going to start with the circle and the ellipse, assuming that you have some background knowledge on circles and how they work. And we're going to really focus on the ellipse, although the two of them are certainly related. So what is a conic section? Why do we call them conic sections? Well, they're about cones that are intersected by a plane. So there are four types of conic sections. Guaranteed, you know, at least two of them. The circle is a conic section. A parabola is a conic section. So in courses prior to this, whether it was pre-calc 1 or elementary or intermediate algebra or high school courses like algebra 2, you've seen circles and you've seen parabolas before. Ellipses and hyperbolas may be new to you. So take a look at this picture here because this does a nice job of explaining how we get these conic sections. There's only one that we need the double cone for. The rest can be made with just one cone. So if you look at this um, first one, right, this first one has a plane that is slicing that cone, but not perpendicular to the base, also not parallel to the base. So it comes in sideways. As that cone um, gets sliced by the plane, you notice what's formed, this parabola over here. So when you slice a cone, not perpendicular to the base, but basically parallel to the sides, the intersection becomes a parabola. So as you slice that cone, parabolas of different sizes will form from that slice. The second one, which you can see up here on the top, is what happens if you slice the cone sort of sideways, but in such a way that it goes through both sides, right? The uh, This one over here goes through this way. This one goes through the other way. When you do that, an ellipse is formed because you're not slicing parallel to the base. The one down the bottom is intended to look like it's parallel to the base. When you do that, you end up with a circle. So if you take a cone and you chop the top off a cone, you end up with a circle, right? You would be looking down at a circle. The last one here requires a double cone to do. So when you slice that plane through two cones at once, you end up with something we call a hyperbola. So a hyperbola has two branches. So the branch up on top and the branch on the bottom are part of the same hyperbola, and then there's a gap in the middle, right? You see two more hyperbolas on the other side with the plane slicing the double cone. So the only one that actually requires a double cone are the hyperbolas. The other ones are just set up with two cones for illustration purposes, a circle down the bottom, the ellipse up the top, and the parabola on the side. So the first thing we do is we start with a review of circles. How do you write the equation for a circle? It is basically the distance formula with both sides squared. Right, so h and k are the center of the circle, r is the radius. And so if you think of a circle, circle requires a center and then the set of all points that are equidistant from that center. And so the distance from the center to the point on the outside is called the radius. So the center of the circle is hk, the point on the outside of the circle is xy, and then you take the difference of the x's and square them, take the difference of the y's and square them, equals the radius squared. Sometimes the circle is centered at the origin, in which case h and k are both zero, and you get an equation that's much simpler and looks like this, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So that's if it's centered at the origin. And I had mentioned that that equation popped up when we were doing polar coordinates. Here again, it pops up as the equation of a circle. All right, let's take a look at a couple of examples. So suppose I gave you these four questions and I said I'd like to find the center and the radius and then sketch them, or at least we'll discuss how to sketch them. The first one's easy. There's no h and no k listed in there. Well, that doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means that they're 0, 0. So the center of this one is the origin. And so it's x squared plus y squared equals r squared, which means if r squared is 16, r is 4. So how do I graph something centered at 0, 0 with a radius of 4? Well, I, go, I start at the origin. I go 4 units to the right. I go four units up, I go four units left, and I go four units down. And then best I can, especially when writing on this tablet here, I try to connect my dots. Right, and so I've got a circle centered at the origin with a radius of four. I right, look at the second one. The second one is x minus the x coordinate squared, y minus the y coordinate squared. So it's x minus three. So my center has an x coordinate of three. This says y plus 5, but the formula says y minus k. So we're going to think of this as y minus a negative 5, and that's the other coordinate. And you could also think of it as just opposites. So opposite of, of negative 3 is 3. 
the opposite of 5 is negative 5. And then again, if that 81 represents r squared, then the radius is 9. So to graph this, you would have to go 3 to the right and 5 down. That's your center. And then again, like we did with the other one, go up, down, left, and right, 9 units, and see what you get. I think I'm just going to make this enormous here. But if I go up 9, what's changing? The y's are changing. So this becomes 3, positive 4. If I went down 9, I'd be at 3, negative 14. Then go left and right. Left and right, the x's change. So I go to the left 9, and I'm here at negative 6, negative 5. And I go to the right 9, and 3 plus 9 is 12, but that stays the same. And then you just connect those dots as best you can. Make it a circle. Make sure you don't make it like a rhombus or anything linear. Make a nice smooth curve, and you've got yourself a circle. All right, the third one, center and radius. So the center is the opposite of each of the coordinates that were given. So the center for number 3 is going to be negative 2, positive 1, right? So that's the center of my circle. It's the opposite of the number with the x's, opposite of the number of the y. The radius here, well, if r squared is 75, then r is the square root of 75, which I can simplify as 5 square root of 3. If you were to actually graph this, you start at negative 2, 1, right? So negative 2, 1. And then you'd have to go up, down, left, and right the square root of 75. Well, what is the square root of 75? The square root of 81 is 9. The square root of 64 is 8. So somewhere between 8 and 9. On a little piece of graph paper, probably about an 8 and a half would do. So not every circle has to have a radius that's an integer value. But yet there are places that we can graph those. So you plot them wherever they appear. All right, the last one has nice numbers. Right? So the center of this circle is negative 2, positive 3. And the radius is 4. But look at this symbol. This is a less than or equal to. Well, that's not the same as equal to. So negative 2, positive 3 is up here. So we go down 4, we go right 4, we go left 4, and we go up 4. And we make, as best we can, something that resembles a circle. But this said that the radius is less than or equal to 16. So it includes the boundary, right? It includes those points that are on the circle that I just drew. But if the radius is less than 4, give me all the places where the radius is smaller than 4. So here the radius is equal to 4, but then there's places where it's less than 4. Essentially, it's everything inside of here. So you get a circle that's shaded in, just like when you were graphing inequalities, linear inequalities, parabolas, things like that. Then depend whether the function was linear or not, you still had shading that you could do, same thing here. If I flipped it around, if it was greater than or equal to 16, then I'd have a funny looking graph because I'd have a hole in the middle, but then everything on the outside would be shaded. And if it didn't include the 16, if it was strictly less than 16, then I would actually make my circle with a dashed curve. And if it was strictly less than 16, I would shade the inside, but I would put that dashed curve on the outside to let people know that this does not include the set of points that are exactly equal to 4. All right, how about these? Find an equation for the given circles. So the first one's easy, centered at 0, 0. x minus 0 squared, y minus 0 squared equals, don't forget the 6 gets squared, 36. Look at that. First one, done. Second one, x minus the x-coordinate. So minus a negative 4 gives me an x plus 4, plus y minus 5 squared equals 3 squared. Done. For the third one, we're going to do an x minus 0 squared, so that's just x squared, plus y minus 5 halves squared equals r squared. And so yeah, one of them can be centered with a coordinate of 0 and the other one not. They don't all have to be centered either at the origin or not on an axis. This one is centered at x equals 0, y equals 5 halves, so it's 2.5 units up on the y-axis. All right, so these were relatively easy things to find equations for. I gave you the equation here. You found the center and radius. I gave you the center and radius. You came up with an equation. So what about these? Hmm. These don't look as nice as the other ones. But yet, yeah, they do have solutions. So let's take a look at the one on the top. I'm going to pick one of these two to do because we're going to practice this rather often. 
let's look at it this way. x squared minus 6x, and I'm going to leave a blank, plus y squared plus 10y equals negative 9. So the first thing is I'm going to throw over to the other side anything that doesn't have a variable in it. Well, in this case, that was already done. If I were going to do the next one, the first thing I would do is move that 9 over to the other side by subtracting it. I would also line up so that my x's are together and my y's are together, which again, if you look at the one underneath it, that's not the case. So I'd move the 8x over here. I'd move the y squared over there, carry the signs with it so that we're in good shape. All right, now what I have to do is complete the square twice. How does completing the square work? Well, you take half the number before the x, square it, and add it to both sides. Really, I'm thinking of this as ax squared plus bx plus c. So the b is the value that's before the x. So we take half the b value and square it. So half of negative 6 is negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9. So I add 9 to this side. I add 9 to this side. All right, in that second piece, the middle term has a 10 before it. So half of 10 is 5, and then 5 squared is 25, so I add a 25 to both sides. Add a 25 here, add a 25 there. What's the point of doing this? The point of doing this is that now I can factor those terms on the left side as perfect squared trinomials. So this first one becomes x minus 3 squared. It's always going to be that middle term, right? So half of negative 6 is negative 3. That's the other term that belongs in there. So we can check this out. First term squared is x squared. Double the inside, so negative 3x times 2 is negative 6x. Negative 3 squared is positive 9. Same thing's true with the other one. Half of 10 is 5, so I get y plus 5 squared. And on the other side, negative 9 plus 9 is 0. And then 0 plus 25 is 25. So now I can identify my center as 3, negative 5 with a radius of 5. All right, so completing the square will help us to figure out what the center and radius is if it's not given in that form. All right, so this is a reminder of stuff you've seen before you got here. All right, what if I gave you this? All right, the equation of the circle with a center of negative 4, 6, which contains the point 2, 3. Hmm. So now i got an h and a k. Right, this is my h and k, that negative 4, 6. Lost my pen. Here we go. That's my h and k. That's my x and y. But yet when I write the equation, I don't want to put numbers in for x and y. I want to put the x and the y in there. You notice what I'm missing is I'm missing the radius. So how does the formula go? x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. So from the writing that I did up here, x is 2, right, that's the bottom point, h is negative 4, so 2 minus a negative 4, and then plus, look over here, y is 3, so 3 minus 6 equals r squared. All right, 2 minus a negative 4 is really 2 plus 4, I forgot my square, 2 plus 4 is 6, 3 minus 6 is negative 3. So I get 36 plus 9 equals r squared. r squared is 45, so r must be the square root of 45. Now, I'm actually not going to simplify that because in about a minute I'm going to be looking for r squared anyway. All right, again, the formula listed right over here. When we go to write our final formula for this, we're going to replace the h and the k, but we're going to leave the x and the y. All right, so we're going to leave the x and the y. Like so. All right, what is h? Up here, h is negative 4. So x minus a negative 4 is x plus 4. y minus 6 equals r squared. Well, if r squared is 45, I'm just going to put the 45 in the other one. That's why I didn't bother simplifying that radical. Because when I go to write the equation for the circle, it's an x squared, y squared equals r squared. So I don't need r. I need r squared. All right, so that's the introduction to circles. We'll catch up in the next video with a